Jack Carpenter was born and spent his early life on Jersey, one of the Channel Islands, a few miles off the northwest coast of France and a hundred miles from Great Britain. Loyal to the British crown, but tiny sovereign countries, Jersey, as well as the islands of Guernsey, Alderney, and Sark, were occupied when France fell to the Germans in World War II, and remained for five years the only British territory to suffer this unfortunate fate. As a teen, Jack and many others, mostly women and children, were evacuated just as the Germans invaded, and although he finally ended up in Canada, he always remained a loyal Jerseyman. Now, in 1994, after spending part of a work life in the Merchant Marine, Jack was working for CKCO's magazine show, Sunday Edition, and this is what brought us together. Over my busy aviation art years, CKCO had shown great interest in my developing career. As it happened, Jack was to be the prime mover in a project which would see me create and donate a painting which was to commemorate a little-known fact from Canada's World War II aviation history. While researching a series he was doing for CKCO TV and the occupation of Jersey, Jack discovered a Canadian connection to the liberation of the island. During the war, Jersey was garrisoned by up to 20,000 German troops. They installed heavily fortified shore defenses and batteries around the coast of the steep cliffed 9 by 14 mile island. And by slave labor from all over Europe, carved an extensive ammunition magazine from a hillside of solid shale, which in the last two years of the war was to become an underground hospital for convalescing German troops. The island population suffered greatly during these years. Thousands were sent to work camps in Germany and two out of three failed to return. Although it was officially forbidden, Jersey citizens were often forced at gunpoint to give up their meager rations of food to the German soldiers, a serious deprivation. But by the arrival of the Red Cross ship Vega in 1944 and 45, with food parcels from Canada and New Zealand, a large part of the population, which was precariously close to starvation, was saved. Eventually, after what were five long, hungry years for the islanders, the Germans on the continent capitulated to the Allies on May the 8th, 1945. The war in Europe was over. Or was it? The Commandant of Jersey, an ardent Nazi, Vice Admiral Huffmeyer, was fully prepared to defend the well-garrisoned island. It's here the Canadian connection was set in motion. Two British destroyers, HMS Beagle and Bulldog, were sent as a show of force to encourage his surrender and some RCAF Mustang pilots, after celebrating the end, unexpectedly found themselves in the air on the 9th of May, providing top cover for this operation. Jack's idea was that I produce a painting which would be donated to the island as a permanent commemoration, illustrating this Canadian connection. I was very eager. It would mean Jay and I would accompany the painting to Jersey and it would be our first overseas trip together. As Jack began to run with the project, looking for support and organizing the details, I couldn't wait to tell my mentor and friend, former 442 Squadron Spitfire and Mustang pilot, Len Wilson, about this commission. I clearly remember the winter day I knocked on his front door. He was busy with family, so I excused myself from coming in. Guess what, I said, standing at the door. I've been commissioned to paint a sortie involving the RCAF on the day after the end of the war in the European theater. Apparently, Canadian Mustangs flew top cover over the capitulation of the German forces on the Channel Islands the day after VE Day. He gave me a very curious look. Wait a minute, he said 
and turned back into the house. In a moment he was back with his World War II flying logbook in hand, open toward the end. He was smiling. I was there, he said emphatically, pointing to his entry for the 9th of May. Somewhere later in this project, I may talk more fully about our trip. Suffice it to say the following. I painted the acrylic Beacons of Liberty, showing the Canadian Mustangs in figure four formation over one of the island's most recognizable landmarks, La Corbière Lighthouse on the southwest corner of Jersey, which I employed as symbols of the dividing line between war and peace. At a reception on Tuesday, September 19, 1995, just two hours after landing on the island, and attended by Jersey's head of government, I spoke of the project and this Canadian connection to their liberation. Then, formally, I unveiled Beacons of Liberty and presented it to the people of Jersey. It now hangs on permanent display at the museum. After the ceremony, these three pilots, Len, John, and Rusty, signed 75 artist proofs of the Beacons of Liberty limited edition print which we had brought with us, as proud wives and family looked on. A second painting, a full sheet watercolor representing the Mustang Len flew that day over another Jersey landmark, King John's Mont Orgai Castle, formed part of the small exhibition of originals I had brought with me. I still consider this to be one of my best. Another watercolor, Willing Pembroke, resulted from the Jersey trip. Six of our party were royally treated to a major aerial tour of the Channel Islands by the generous owner of a vintage RAF aircraft, Cathay Pacific pilot Martin Willing. Martin is very proud of his hunting Percival Pembroke. The Pembroke was a medium transport in service mainly in the RAF between the 50s and the 80s. Martin's aircraft, which he flies at air shows in the United Kingdom, is fitted as a VIP transport with six seats and two tables. Weather on the day of our flight was about two tenths cloud and provided a fairly turbulent ride over the water. Sorry to confess, I was so airsick upon return to Jersey Airport that I missed the rest of that day's island festivities. What a curse. Nevertheless, this overview of the islands represents a major memory for me in a trip full of very memorable moments, including fine views of La Corbiere Lighthouse. We had an amazing time. I personally found the greatest reward this project offered was simply to be in the company of these three former World War II pilots as we attended events and toured the historical sites. I felt decidedly privileged just to be witness to the close relationship which they had managed to maintain all these 50 years. They were a band of brothers, except somehow much, much more. And as of this moment, thankfully, all three are still with us. This is no ordinary occasion. Politicians and war veterans are at the Rich Thistle Art Gallery in Stratford as the raps are taken off Thistle's latest masterpiece, Beacons of Liberty. Rich Thistle, an outstanding aviation artist, has a number of well-documented wartime paintings to his credit. With most of the Western world celebrating the 50th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe, and the end of hostilities in the European theater, Thistle's painting graphically illustrates the last and little-known operational flight of the RCAF two days after the war officially ended. It's just 
just beautiful and it's so uh, realistic and it has the depth and uh, it just gives you a feeling of freedom. Yes, it evokes a, a certain period I've forgotten all about, really. But it's very, it's a very uh, uh, fine painting. That has been very well captured by the artist and you get the feeling that you're, you're right there with them. I get a feeling of pride in being a Canadian and being a part of what it's all about. It's beautiful. It's truly beautiful, the island and the, and the sight of those Canadian uh, pilots flying on their Mustangs over that uh, outstanding landmark, uh, the lighthouse. These comments from civic leaders and ex-servicemen as they view the painting were one of the most recognizable landmarks in the island of Jersey and a flight of Canadian Air Force Mustangs. The occasion? The liberation of the Channel Islands after five years of German occupation. The Canadian participation Sissel first discovered in a conversation with flying officer Len Wilson. I remember standing at the door and saying, Len, I'm going to paint a picture about the Channel Islands. And he said, wait a minute. And he says, he went and got his logbook and he says, I was there. So that was a, that was a fortuitous uh, uh, happening. And, uh, and from that point, we, uh, we did some further research. Uh, I had help from you and I had help from, uh, from John Mallandane, another 442 uh, uh, pilot from British Columbia, who's sort of the, uh, I guess, the unofficial historian of 442, and he sent some specific information about that particular day. First, the events that led up to that day. The only British territory to be occupied by the Germans, the Channel Islands, are located in the English Channel, 100 miles from England and 12 miles off the coast of France. Sunday, 6th of May, 1945. End of the war imminent. 442 Squadron, very quiet. This is it. Nazis have surrendered. Celebrating starts. Official V Day will be tomorrow. Royal Navy destroyers dispatched to Channel Islands to take surrender of German garrison. VE Day, naturally, there's no flying. HMS Bulldog and Beagle arrive at the Channel Islands. The Germans do not surrender. They consider the naval ships an act of provocation. The British give the Germans an ultimatum and then move away. Royal Navy's ships return. They request support. Surprise to everyone. 442 Squadron ordered into action. They will escort the naval force in liberation of the Channel Islands. 442 Squadron was an excellent choice for this mission. Twelve combat experienced pilots flying Mustangs with heavy firepower and the very necessary long-range capabilities. One of the twelve was flying officer Len Wilson of Stratford, who on this occasion was reunited with a mint-conditioned Mustang owned by Stratford resident Gary McCann. When you see the plane now, as, as your mind goes back to those days, this flew extremely well, didn't it? It was almost a perfect airplane, yes. It, uh, it had virtually no bad habits, uh, except that you didn't drain your fuselage tank first, the one behind, uh, behind me here. Uh, it could get uh, a little bit hairy in, in tight turns and, and landing if you didn't do that. So that was almost the first thing you did was get rid of the fuel in the fuselage tank. Yes, yeah. But otherwise than that, it, it, had, it was perfectly a predictable aircraft. You, as a young man, flew Hurricanes, Spitfires, and this, uh, the Mustang. Yes, I had a very brief exposure to Hurricanes, uh, uh, but mostly I flew the Spitfire on, on operations. And this was just the tail end of the operations. So now here we are on May the 9th. You, you, you're, you've got to scramble. You had a do on. Mm -hmm. So you were called out, and you're fully armed, and you had your long-range tanks on. How did you feel two days after the war that you were going into action? Well... I don't think we thought much about it. It was it was just another another trip. Yes. And uh, we we didn't we didn't think it was going to be very serious because the war was over. Uh, but uh, we didn't know all, all the details behind the the trip. We were just told we were going to fly to the Channel Islands and uh, and do top cover for a couple of destroyers who were who were taking over the islands. Well, you weren't aware that those islands were well fortified and there were forty thousand troops there. No, we weren't. We had very little information about that. Now, in hindsight, here 50 years later, how do you feel uh, about an event like that, which is now, in the, in the book, is quoted as being probably the official last sortie of the European theater? Well, it's very, uh, uh, very rewarding to think that uh, we did have the last, uh, last operational trip of the war. I mean, that's, uh, that's a, a bit of a landmark, and mm -hmm. especially uh, to survive the last one, that's, that's uh, a plus. Well, we know the facts. We know that the Channel Islands were held off by the Germans for one more day after the war. 
But of course, we didn't know how Rich Thistle got into this until we discovered in his uh, Stratford Gallery, you had already a painting of the 442 Squadron. Right, 442 Squadron uh, flew from D-Day right into Germany. So, uh, I, I, uh, having a local uh, person who flew in 44 Squadron helps a lot when you're when you're wanting to do uh, careful research. So, Len Wilson has helped me. I like to paint uh, things that uh, that will focus people's attention on Canada's contribution in the war. You must have spent a considerable amount of time researching this to make it work. I always do. Being a, a, a an historical artist puts a little bit more pressure on you, I think, than maybe the other work that I do, which is uh, landscape. It's uh, something that requires exacting uh, uh, research. Sometimes I have to uh, spend months and months looking for information. How accurate is the painting? The pilot has the answer. It's uh, historically sound and uh, and very very fine reproduction of the of the scene at the time. This aircraft is uh, uh, John Mallandane flying in in Y two B. He's flying number two to the wing commander, and if you could look down below from above, you would see that he's slightly behind him. On uh, the right of the wing commander is my myself flying Y two W. And to my right is uh, Rusty McCrae from Stellarton, Nova Scotia, and he will be flying one number two. I think it's a unique story in the war. Here were the uh, Canadian Air Force pilots flying cap over the, uh, the island while the British uh, took the surrender of the Germans. I pay tribute to this famous squadron and, the, and the, the quality of the pilots in that squadron. And when you look at this picture, and you see those uh, Mustangs flying in that formation and the beautiful uh, lighthouse as they fly over this island. It brings back those kinds of memories of the war and the contribution that the Canadians paid in the liberation of Jersey. I didn't even know that the Channel Islands were occupied until about two years ago when I visited Jersey. And how do you feel about the occasion now? Uh, I can see there's a little pride in your eye. There certainly is. You know, I'm excited about it. And uh, like you say, it's... Uh, I think uh, all Canadians can be proud of what we, you know, the role that we played in the war, and uh, this one is certainly no exception. Artist Rich Thistle wishes to donate the painting to the states of Jersey and profit from the limited edition print to support their new museum. Details are not yet complete, but it will be a fitting sequel to the 50th anniversary of Canadian service in World War II. This is Jack Carpenter reporting. In April of 1993, the Toronto Aviation and Aircraft Show, the largest of its kind in North America, serving many areas of aviation, held its first show. Its mission to encompass aspects of military, commercial, general and heritage aviation. A few months later, I was approached by the two young men who had launched it to see if I would become their official show artist. On an annual basis, this would mean a special painting, which we would use to design and publish the official fine art show poster. We would receive part of our booth and a good portion of our profit from sales at the event. Having considered the attendance statistics from the first year, I must admit it seemed like a reasonable business proposition to us. They expected 30 to 40,000 attendees at the next one. I saw it as a good opportunity to showcase my work and decided it would definitely create fertile ground for possible commissions. So we jumped at the chance. One thing I do remember, as these two left the gallery that day after our first meeting it suddenly hit me, they had asked that my first image encompass not only the four areas of aviation, but illustrate the family theme of the show as well, while speaking as a painting and, of course, functioning as a poster. A tall order. I wondered what I had got myself into. I've always resisted the typical collage layout, which I have seen so often as a solution to this sort of problem. After some days of consideration, I finally came up with a resolution. The central image in my painting would be a Cessna 150 taking off from a small airport with two onlookers in the foreground. I envisioned a father and daughter watching mom as she sold them for the first time. To 
cover the military and heritage aspect, Jay suggested that I paint a model of a World War II Mitchell B-25 bomber in the little girl's hand. We knew Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Mitchell was to be at the show, and as it turned out, it was right across from our booth. In the background, commercial flying would have a small mention in the form of a Canadian Airlines 747, well off in the distance. The show was to be held at Canadian Airlines hangar at Toronto Pearson Airport. I chose to paint a 170 belonging to a local photographer, Morris Oliver, who had once come to a show at her gallery and boasted to me he had the best looking Cessna around. Finally, a la Norman Rockwell, I asked a neighbor and his daughter to come to my studio to pose for the figures. I called this painting, Follow Your Dreams, and around the image we posted our first TAS Fine Art poster, ready for the show in April of 1994. Displaying at this event required major effort, set up on the Thursday and three show days with only Jay and I to man the booth and finally take down after the show on Sunday. Although the first show was not as financially successful as we had predicted, we made the decision to try again and over the next two years went through the same process with two new paintings. 1995 saw the painting Promise of the Early Morning, an image that had its generation during a visit to John and Joan Douglas's cottage on the Muskoka River at Mary Lake as the theme image for the TASS show. This modified Cessna 180 on floats belonged to Ted Johnson of Power Corporation and it lived at the cottage next door. I encountered it on a Don Ramble while the rest were still asleep. We loved Promise and published it not only as the show poster, but also as a limited edition print. Again, we spent a great deal of energy and money participating in the 1995 show. The third, and as it happened, the last show painting, his and hers, had its genesis through our meeting Wayne O'Shea at the first show. Wayne was only one of several millionaires my aviation career brought me in contact with. His and hers featured his kit-built modified Murphy Rebel LE and his wife Leah's customized 1964 Corvette Stingray against his hangar near Penetang Machine. The only fiction in this painting is the business sign I created for him. Wayne has become a friend and furthermore my major collector. He owns this painting as well as five others, all major acrylics. Our three years as show artist proved hectic and very expensive for us as we self-published the poster and prints, always hoping to recoup our outlay at the show. But if we hadn't met Wayne and another collector, Bob Brown, who subsequently commissioned two paintings at these shows, we might have lost money in this venture. As a result, we decided to end our TAS association after the 1996 show and gave the 97 show a miss. But in 1998, the show moved to Downsview Airport and we decided to give it one more go, although we did not publish the show poster. I did enjoy certain aspects of the TAS shows, but in 1998, we were again somewhat disappointed and decided this would definitely be our last year. Considering the financial climate of the 90s, I suppose we were fortunate to do as well as we did at these shows and the resulting commissions did end up saving our bottom line. Unfortunately for us, we had missed the affluent 80s by a decade, and although I have absolutely no regrets, in my aviation art career, this sort of story was more the rule than the exception.
1986, we moved from our home in the country south of Stratford to a new home in the city we designed and built. It was here we first tried out the idea of an invited show, a solo exhibition of recent landscape and aviation paintings, which was moderately successful. But by the late 80s, we had decided we also needed facilities which would allow us to take my aviation show on the road, mostly to air shows and Air Force reunions. I designed and constructed a portable display booth which would fit in the back of my new 1990 Blazer. And eventually in 1997, I taught myself to weld, creating a weather-resistant roof for the booth which allowed us to frequent outdoor as well as indoor shows. From Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Father's Day shows to the Great War Flying Museum's Fly-Ins to shows at Trenton, Centralia, Mirkirk, Goderich, Grand Bend, Hanover, Brantford, to London International and Collingwood, as well as other shows and reunions, we followed the Aviation Pied Piper. Fortunately for me, I just enjoyed being at these shows, watching Heritage Aircraft fly, and having my work out there because our commercial success was moderate at best and dismal at worst. But Jay and I were rarely pessimistic. The next show would always be the one. We never lacked a sense of looming success over the years. Looking back, it seems we were bears for punishment. None of these shows was a small commitment in time and effort, and we just kept on doing them. By the late 80s, the kids were well on in school and Jay decided to teach full time for three years as a teaching assistant. But as the 90s loomed, it was she who dreamed of opening and running a commercial gallery. We always thought we could do better than any of the several galleries which represented us through Southern Ontario. So it was that in 1991, we purchased and renovated a three-story 1892 Victorian house on the edge of the business zone in Stratford, creating a first floor gallery, and living quarters on the upper two stories. More about this project much later. Our new Gallery 164 showcased my work, representing several local artists as well, and for almost 10 years, Jay kept the doors open five days a week, 51 weeks a year. Running a commercial gallery, we employed more conventional ways of promoting my work, and also began to host annual Christmas shows, mainly by invitation. Jay worked very hard to foster the expansion of my career, including developing a newsletter we called Flight Lines. I was the fairly frequent subject of articles in our local paper, The Beacon Herald. They supported me fully over the years. Some of the projects I undertook were major, some even of national significance, and along the way we continued building our stable of limited edition prints and posters. Most of our profits were plowed back into the gallery business. We continued to publish and sell reproductions and, fairly frequently, originals, often to international clients who visited our gallery or found us online. At that time, we were pioneers of selling on the web, and Jay used our website, initiated in 1997, 
as a learning tool which helped her establish herself as a website designer and programmer with the help of Todd Ridinger and our current business partner Jeff Stewart. In 1997 I took early retirement after 30 years, 28 of which were teaching and consulting in art. Finally, we were wholly self-employed with all its virtues and some of its shortcomings. But regrettably, we were enduring the lengthy recession of the 90s and eventually had to accept that our great gallery experiment was no longer sustainable. Fairly certain we could not be faulted for lack of effort, we made the decision to close the gallery and actually move away from our hometown. We soon also decided to quit the air show circuit as well. Enough of the gypsy life. In the fall of 1999, we held our last Christmas show at Gallery 164. This time the theme was New Acrylic Landscapes. In late fall, we headed north to our current home in Wasaga Beach, where we both continue to work at this art thing, and now at Jay's web design business as well. Although some who know me best might not agree entirely, I consider myself a relatively balanced person, if only in the sense that I feel equally comfortable expressing my ideas in words as well as materials. I have always enjoyed writing, mostly for practical purposes, and as a rule, nonfiction. As a result, I was enthusiastic when, in the mid-90s, I was offered a column in the Canadian Owners and Pilots newspaper, Canadian Flight. For about two and a half years, under the title Aviation Images, I hammered out a major article each month, most often about the story behind one of my paintings, usually focusing on Canadian aviation history, much of it, of course, pertaining to World War II. When I eventually ran out of breath, I had completed about 30 substantial articles, probably enough to fill a decent book. Jay and I actually met with a Toronto publisher about a book project, and I actually entertained this idea for a brief moment, before I thought better of it. Although I wrote for Canadian Flight for the good of my career only, I was actually paid the going rate for writing I did for the Cowles History Group magazine, Aviation History. I was quite happy to be afforded the chance through these articles to broaden the American audience's horizons about aspects of Canadian aviation history with which they were possibly entirely unfamiliar. In their Art of Flight section, Aviation History magazine published three of my articles, including in 1994 the story of David Hornell in Press On Regardless. In 1995, the story of Ken Boomer and his victory over Kiska in the Aleutian campaign. And also 1995, around the painting Into the Blue, my story of the disastrous fire at Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum, which destroyed their Spitfire, Avenger, and Hurricane. In 1998 and 99, Aviation History published two feature articles, of which I am most proud. The first, in 98, around my painting Dream Machine, was the most Canadian of aviation stories, the saga of the ill-fated Avro Canada CF-105 Arrow, the huge supersonic interceptor, then at the cutting edge of aviation development and technology, which, as a victim of vicious national politics, met its ignominious end in 1959, the year I turned 13. Canadian aviation has never 
never been quite the same. Then, in 1999, it was my article about perhaps Canada's most famous and possibly most controversial aviator, World War I's Billy Bishop. My sidebar for this article dealt with the various contentious aspects surrounding one of the most colorful characters in all aviation history. For me, these articles were major projects, representing a great deal of effort on my part. I will always be thankful for the support of the Avro VP of Engineering for the Aero Project, James Floyd, who held my hand and edited my version of the Aero story. He was merciless, but I was definitely the benefactor of his unique first-hand expertise. Test pilot Jan Zurakowski put the arrow through its paces. For 27 minutes, he kept searching for the one design flaw that would spell the aircraft's undoing. But in fact, the first flight was very uneventful, and the only thing that I can remember about the snag list was uh, the, he criticized the position of two electrical switches. Oh, and he said he wanted a clock in the aircraft, I guess. He wanted to come down in time for lunch. The only disappointment for me was that the magazine chose not to include my digital drawing comparing the dimensions of the Arrow to another Avro aircraft, the World War II Lancaster Mark 10 heavy bomber. Surprisingly, these two aircraft were pretty well equivalent in size. Of course, I also feel significant satisfaction seeing my paintings on the covers of books and magazines. My first cover was on the Canadian magazine Air Force in 1990 featuring We Flew with the Heroic Few. Three more Air Force covers followed, Where There's Smoke in 1991, Hornets Over the Gulf in 1992, and Pursuit of the Luciana, which they commissioned in 93. My Hornets cover received high praise from then-editor Doug Steubing. He said it was their best cover ever, and who am I to argue? But when Doug died, unfortunately, my association with the magazine ended with him. As a postscript to this era, in November of 96, I donated the original painting Pursuit of the Luciana to 14 Wing at Greenwood, out of which the Aurora in the painting was operating. Len Wilson, who had flown the long-range Argus out of Greenwood in the 50s, visited his former base and presented the original in my place. For me, my Aviation History magazine covers seemed an affirmation of where I hoped my aviation career was heading. I was pretty happy to see my work there. In 1995, a vertical painting particularly well suited for a magazine cover, Final Victory, also fronted the Aviation History feature article on von Richthofen. The next year, the Cowles Group commissioned me to paint Black Lynx Victory, representing a unique and somewhat obscure World War II event, which saw an American-built Brewster Buffalo flying in the Finnish Air Force about to shoot down a British-built Spitfire in Russian markings. It's the kind of original I would never have expected to sell. But Black Lynx Victory was in fact purchased some time later by a museum. Who could predict? In 2003, my painting The Memphis Bell also made the aviation history cover, again for a feature article by another author. I think this one was born for cover treatment. Over the years, my images have also appeared on book covers. Besides Rhino Charge on Phil Hanley's Nickel on the Grass, there was Dieppe Dawn on John Renison's The Digby Diary, In the Balance on Barb Henner's The Tunnel King, and Victory Over Kiska on Brendan Coyle's book, War on Our Doorstep. 
Thistle images appear elsewhere as well, in films such as in the documentary A Hero to Me, Diana Bishop's tribute to her grandfather Billy. other books as well. The use donated by me just because I'm such a nice guy. Canadian Forces 431 Air Demonstration Squadron, the Snowbirds, in their Canadian designed and manufactured Canadair CT-114 Tudor jets are respected worldwide for their incredible skill and expertise. Just ask any other team like the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds who is the best and you will unfailingly get the same response. It's the Snowbirds. I've been a true fan of the Snowbirds since their inception in 1970 and have had, over my aviation art years, many opportunities to see them at their work. So, in the early spring of 1999, when I was approached by one of my former students, kinsman Jim Ritchie, co-chair of the committee which was bringing the Snowbirds to Stratford for her September 1st show, to create two original paintings for what they were calling the Up Close and Personal with the Canadian Snowbirds event. I just couldn't resist. One painting would be gifted to the birds by the committee and the other would be raffled to the general public as a kinsman fundraiser around the event. Although I gave them a bit of a deal, I was well and fairly compensated. Jim also asked if I would be the after-dinner speaker at the public banquet, which was to be held the evening of the event. Now, over the years, I've done such presentations using a slideshow, possibly as many as 30 or 40 times, most often to service clubs, about my experience and motivation as an aviation artist. But sometimes my presentation was made to more major assemblies, such as the National Convention of the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association. As it happened, this particular speech was to be the catalyst for an association which I came to value almost more than any other in my career. That summer, I produced two paintings. First, with the lively and bright watercolor, Double Diamond Radical Twins, which would be the fundraiser to be drawn for that day at the banquet. And then came the patriotic Canadian icons using the maple leaf flag in the sky to be gifted to the team by the kinsmen. When the Stratford Snowbird event rolled around, in contrast to our rather disastrous CBC filming day, the weather cooperated fully. It was a beautiful shirt sleeve sunny late summer day, just before the end of the summer holidays. Everything went according to plan. I attended a public lunch with the Snowbirds catered at the airport and we were all treated to a typical, absolutely thrilling Snowbird show at 4.30 that afternoon.
By the time of the evening banquet, which was a very large event for Stratford, attended by hundreds, things were lagging a bit behind schedule. After the meal and what seemed endless speeches by dignitaries and committee members, it was finally my turn. I wondered by that time of night and after a big meal if anyone there would be awake enough to really take in what I had to show and tell. So, with a certain sense of trepidation on my part, the lights were dimmed and I began. My presentation was a Coles Notes version of the story I have related in this film, and with the help of a considerable adrenaline rush, I, I felt it was one of my best ever. I remember one of the snowbirds spoke after to thank the committee, the people gathered there, and me for my presentation. It had certainly been a memorable day, capped off for me in the very best possible way. I'll never forget it. 1999 was our last year at Gallery 164, and I spent most of my painting time producing acrylic landscapes for my final Christmas show that fall. But sometime after the Stratford Snowbird event, we received a call. It was Tim Timbo Rawlings, that year's Snowbird number 5. Snowbird commander and team lead Major Bob Cowboy Pancho had put Tim in charge of organizing this 30th anniversary reunion, which would cap off their 30th anniversary year taking place in 2000. He was calling to see if I would be interested in partnering with the team for this major celebration. It seems the team secretary, Marg Fowler, simply loved the watercolor Canadian icons, which they had taken back to their base at Moose Jaw to hang in their mess. It was she who more or less insisted that the team commission me to produce a 30th anniversary painting for them. What's more, they also wanted to publish a limited edition print of the image, which would be signed by the whole team. Of course, I was honored by the request, and soon produced a watercolor which fulfilled their rather specific requirements. They wanted two teams represented. The first team, which was a seven ship, and the current team, which was made up of nine aircraft. Sixteen aircraft in all. And, according to Marg's explicit instructions, it was also to contain a large Canadian flag. Well, that's how it happened. The painting I called Flying the Flag was completed. We published the limited edition and shipped it to Moose Jaw for the mass team signing. And we became, and still are, through an agreement with the Department of National Defense Intellectual Properties Department, the Snowbirds' agents, and sell their prints for them on a profit-sharing basis. Jay and I decided we should also publish Double Diamond as a limited edition, and did so in early 2001. We intended to have this print signed by Team Commander Bob Painshow when the birds were at the London International Show in the summer of 2001, but a major wrench was thrown into those plans when, just prior to the show, Cowboy's tutor ended up in Lake Erie. Fortunately, he was only slightly injured. Eventually, the prints did catch up with the team, were signed by Bob, and we had our second snowbird print, with part of the proceeds to support their reunion fund. We were able to coordinate with the team during their 30th anniversary, and attended and displayed at some events with them that year. The Snowbirds always end their busy flying year with a final private show in October at their base in Moose Jaw, but for this special 30th anniversary year, they had also organized a major season-ending event. Teams from former years and other military display and solo pilots, some from other countries, were to attend. Jay and I were proud to be invited. We simply had to be there. And we took my airshow art display with us halfway across Canada. Not being the world's most frequent travelers, this trip to Moose Jaw and the event itself were definitely memorable for us. I've written a major article, which is archived elsewhere in this project, about the trip and event. 
Suffice it to say, our snowbird connection led to one of the most significant chapters in my aviation art career, and one which I will always remember with huge satisfaction and fondness. It was a privilege to be part of this special snowbird year, rubbing shoulders and making friends with the best aerobatic display team in the world. Jay and I both treasure this experience. As of this date, my aviation body of work numbers 140 paintings and drawings. This is actually the first time I have counted. Somehow I thought it would be more than that. Statistically then, my aviation work accounts for something more than one quarter of my artistic output, which numbers somewhere well over 500. Although my present passion for aviation and history hasn't abated in the least, my busiest aviation time was definitely in the mid-90s. It built slowly to that peak and has declined just as gradually to the present. In fact, I'm not altogether certain about the current status of my aviation career. My last aviation work is dated 2006. Julie's Jewel had been partly completed and temporarily put away at least a couple of years prior. Then, in an act of supreme self-discipline, I finally revisited this image and completed it in 06. It may or may not be my last aviation work. I really don't know. In fact, in 2001, I painted a major acrylic aviation work I called Don't Climb, Don't Dive, Just Turn, with which I remember thinking at the time I could easily have concluded my aviation painting. I chose to paint it partly because of a photo I ran into in an aviation history magazine. It was used in a feature article about a famous British World War II Spitfire pilot, Robert Stanford Tuck, a name I certainly recognized, although I had to read the article to find out why. Tuck, who had almost failed flight school in the late 30s, became an ace, shooting down five aircraft in his first 24 hours of combat in the Battle of Britain. He was, at war's end, one of the Allies' top-scoring aces, with 29 victories. Rising to the rank of Wing Commander, he was shot down in his Spitfire Mark V, personalized with his initials, as was the prerogative of Wing Commanders, and it was actually his initials which attracted my attention. They are the same as mine. So, for this reason, I wanted to paint his Spitfire, and in doing so, purposefully chose to create a sort of echo of my very first aviation painting, Through the Gate. I decided to include, as a famous opponent, with whom Tuck actually dined after being shot down, Adolf Galland in his ME-109E. As far as I know, this pairing was fanciful, but possible. And since the Mark V Spit could outturn an ME-109E, I decided this painting should be composed on this maneuver which every British pilot would keep in his defensive repertoire. At the time, I thought these two paintings, probably equal in passion, Through the Gate and Don't Climb, in a way formed an interesting pair of bookends for my aviation body of work. I feel they are illustrative of the progress I have made over the almost 20 years which separates them. They form, in my mind, an interesting comparison of then and now. If my aviation career is in fact over, I am in no way embarrassed or disappointed. True to myself, I have followed my passion wherever it led. And, as I said at the beginning of this film, my career took me down roads I never would have dreamed of traveling. I find the journey has been entirely exciting and meaningful.